you know, I was on the training table. I was going through my ACL. I'm hardly straight in my leg. I uh, can't walk. I get called up to the general manager's office and he says, you know, we, we don't need you on the Raiders anymore. You're listening to For the Athlete, a podcast aimed at humanizing the athlete by giving them a platform to control their own narrative and tell their life stories. As always, here's your host, Brooks Huber. You all loved last week's episode, and I'm confident you'll love this one too, as I am joined by none other than Dolphins fullback, Alec Ingold. Alec, it's so great to have you on the show. I appreciate you having me on, man. I'm excited. I heard there's some uh, rapid fire questions we get to start off with, so I'm juiced. Alec, you are entering your fifth NFL season. You're an author. You have your own foundation. We're going to touch on all of this and then some in the next 30 minutes. And then, like you said, we have rapid fire. So if you want to jump into that right now, we can. Let's roll, baby. All right. Three, two, one, go. Sport you played the most growing up. Uh, wrestling. Football position in high school. Quarterback. College you attended. Wisconsin. Major in college. Personal finance. Favorite TV show. Ted Lasso right now. Yeah, last teammate you're giving the ox to. Last teammate? I'm giving it to, uh, shoot, this is not fast. I'm going to give it to Blake Ferguson last. He likes that southern country, like slow country. <laughs> All right, best trash talker on the team. Well, it might be Jalen Ramsey now. Shoot, I haven't heard him, but I, I you know, he has a legacy kind of um, a preceding himself. Yeah. What's your go-to book? Seven Crucibles. All right, that's his own book. We'll be touching on that later. Favorite singer? Uh, I'm a big J. Cole fan. And then favorite song? Favorite song? Uh, My Life is Good. Anything from 2014, Forest Hills Drive, that's an absolute certified banger of an album. Awesome. Xbox or PlayStation? Uh, shoot, I'm an Xbox guy through and through. Great answer. Favorite player growing up? I mean, William Henderson, man. He was awesome. Awesome fullback for the Packers back in the day. Favorite team growing up? Favorite team was the Green Bay Packers. Okay. Kind of assume that when you said Packers right there. Dream job outside of playing fullback for the Miami Dolphins. Dream job? Maybe a, a football coach maybe one day? A little running back coach at a high school somewhere, local high school, that'd be fun. That's awesome. Well, that was the rapid fire portion. We're just gonna go through these questions. What made you decide to go to the University of Wisconsin? Uh, I mean, that was the dream school growing up. I had a offer at Northern Illinois to play quarterback. And I got a very, very late offer from Wisconsin, which was the dream school, grew up in Green Bay. That's where I wanted to go. And it was just as an athlete. A uh, brand new coach came in, offered me the, the, you know, a scholarship, was one of the lowest ranked recruits getting into that class. Uh, and it was really just a leap of faith. Had to try and see if I could make it with the big dogs. So I took that leap and uh, never looked back since. Coach Chris was the coach. And he offered me, he's from Pitt, offered me at Pitt. Then he gets the Wisconsin job, carries over that that um, offer. But he was like, you know, I see a lot of similarities between you and James Conner in high school. Like he was a running back, super good athlete. We brought him in as a linebacker and then he switched over to running back and the rest is history, right? One of the greatest running backs ever. Um, gets diagnosed with cancer, the Conner Strong story, makes it to the NFL, like absolute certified baller, right? Like very like top of the top and he's like we we see little hints of that in you so why don't you come here why don't you be an athlete we'll start you at linebacker and we'll find a spot for you and so i started at linebacker learning how to play defense what to play how to do it and then you know a bunch of running backs go down with injuries and that was my shot that was my opportunity to make it onto the field so that's what i that's what i did i took it that's incredible the next one i have to ask you is have you seen the latest ted lasso season yeah, I watched the, the brand new episode last night. Are you kidding me? I was going to binge watch all of them, but I'm not going to pay the $5.99 for the whole month or whatever. But they're releasing one at a time. So it's going to be a three-month release. So it's smart on their part, but not mine. See, but I like Apple TV. I think they got a good, a lot of good stuff. Severance was a good episode or a good uh, TV series. 
Uh, they have good movies in there that are kind of one-offs. They're a little different. Their Apple originals are pretty good. So I, I dive into all that stuff, man. That's how when you're in the league and you're in the off season, you're working out hard. The best way to kind of relax and rejuvenate is to put that feet up. You know, whether it's video games or whatever, you're not exerting yourself, right? We're not going out, um, hanging out a bunch like on the weekends. You're not running around on the beach down here in Florida. Like you're trying to stay inside. You're trying to like, you know, recover, hang out with family, just spend good time together, watch some shows, um, do the off the field stuff so that you're not, you know, you can train and really go hard in the mornings when, when it's time to go hard. You said that Jalen Ramsey will probably be the best trash talker on the team. Do you talk any trash? Are you outside the huddle talking or laughing while pancaking someone like George Kittle? So I am normally not, but then there was a, a mic'd up with me against the, the Bills when we were playing them uh, at their place. Snowballs were flying everywhere and my, like, I don't know what happened with my temper. I started talking all this trash. I forgot I was mic'd up and I was just yelling at people. Like I never do that ever, ever, ever. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, there's a six minute long YouTube clip of me talking trash to other guys that I normally don't do that to. So, um, no, I like to think of myself as a respectful guy. Like I'm going to just go back to the huddle. We'll do it again. Keep, keep going, stay on track. But yeah, I don't know, whatever, for whatever reason, some of those rivalry games, it gets, it gets heated in those piles. I loved that game because there were snowballs flying all over the field, total snow game. That kind of transitions me into our normal questions. Your teammates also think of you as a respectful guy because you received many honors since you've been in the league. You were this year's Dolphins recipient of the Ed Block Courage Award, which is the annual award given to teammates who are role models and in inspirations, sportsmanship, and courage. You were the Dolphins nominee this year for the Art Rooney Sportsmanship Award given in recognition of outstanding sportsmanship on the playing field. And you were the Raiders Walter Payton Man of the Year nominee in 2020. This is kind of a loaded question, but what does receiving these nominations mean to you? And why is it important to be a role model to the younger generation, have sportsmanship, and go out and do work in your community? I think anytime the people that you work with, when they can respect you and kind of give you that nod of recognition and honor, like those, those are the awards that mean the most uh, because it's the guys you show up every single day with, that you work out with, that, that you blood, sweat, and tears you sacrifice with, right? Like those are my guys. And for them to, you know, see that award and, and kind of dish it my way, man. It's just the ultimate sign of respect, uh, accountability. And it just, it motivates you so much more to keep showing up the way you do, uh, being consistent and knowing that you're on the right track with things. You're treating people with respect, you're raised the right way, and, and you hope that uh, you can be a positive influence in a locker room. Like the NFL stands for not for long, right? So while I'm in it, while I'm doing this, I'm gonna give everything, every ounce, of effort I can to those guys in the locker room, to those coaches, to the front office, to everybody, right? And um, those awards are, are cool when uh, you have those people voting on it, respecting you, and saying, "Let's, this is one of our guys, and we're gonna move forward with that. So always really cool. You never do it for the awards. You do it for the relationships. You do it for the communication. You do it for the conversations. You do it for the purpose behind everything. But when you get those pats on the back, you definitely use that as motivation to keep fueling forward. See, I thought NFL stood for no fun league, not not for long, but that's just me. Was that kind of a lower question? Because I wanted to ask you all of those things, but maybe I could have put it into a better question. No, that was awesome. I think it was great. And I feel like you put your own little, little spin on it, little emphasis, little opinion, and um, kind of dished it out that way. A lot of information there. So no, it was definitely easy to answer. And I'm glad you asked it. Yeah, a lot of information there. So last week on the show, I interviewed Jaguars linebacker Foyer Lucan, and I asked him this question, and I want to ask you this question as well. I love hearing the answers from it. Let's say the whole NFL thing didn't work out, and you have your degree in personal finance. What would you have used that degree for, assuming you didn't have the connections or knowledge you currently possess? Yeah, so I actually accepted a job offer at Oracle, uh, which is a software tech company. It was going to be external sales. So. Uh, I was an undrafted guy and I used, you know, all my resources at the University of Wisconsin professional development to land that job offer. And I was able to call him after I made the team because I did not know if I was going to make the team or not that first, that first training camp. Once I made it, I was able to tell him, you know, you, I'm going to, I'm going to have to cancel that, that job because uh, I, I have a, a different day job now. So I, I was going to be Oracle. I was going to get into tech sales. I was going to be a, a salesman and 
um, work through that ladder. And that's kind of where you find that competitive spirit. You find different purpose and passions in business. And I feel like there's so many parallels between high achievers, the one percenters in entrepreneurship, in business, as well as athletics. And I feel like that's where there's a lot of mutual respect between the two. I totally agree because I talked to Foyer about that. Every single player has an entrepreneurial side. It's just, it's rarely talked about. And I love talking about with you guys and shedding light on that. And that's kind of what For the Athlete is about. Shedding light on topics that you guys want to talk about, you guys are passionate about. And so you kind of touched on this. Let's now talk about your dedication and perseverance. The whole world, including myself, loves hearing an underdog story, and you certainly qualify as one. Talk me through what it was like going undrafted, finding out that you made the Raiders roster, and then proving you belong. I think that going undrafted was one of the worst days of my life, but also one of the best lessons I ever learned. And that was just about the amount of sacrifice, the willing to keep a sustained motivation towards that lifelong dream and goal, and being told no, and listening to it, and not taking offense to it. I didn't take it personally. I was able to use it as some fuel. I was able to adjust from that. I was able to overcome that and ultimately be able to, to give a phone call to my parents, you know, during the middle of training camp towards the end of it, letting them know that I made the team. And it was different than the phone call you're supposed to receive uh, from a GM on draft day and ESPN's there and everyone cheers and celebrates. You know, it's a different type of validation. Uh, but at the end of the day, you kind of learn that lesson of, you're really not doing it for the external validation. You don't do it for the awards. You don't do it for the recognition. You don't do it for the honor. You do it because you love it. You do it because it, it's purposeful. You, be, you do it because it inspires other people uh, to do great things. And to find purpose in that, to find those little tweaks of adversity and be able to kind of figure yourself out through all of that, uh, it was one of the biggest blessings I've had. And I think that's what's the biggest testimony to, or biggest testament to my career thus far and what's ahead. That's an incredible takeaway. So were there any other teams that were calling your, or your agent about all of this? And I can tell now how you're a motivational speaker. I read that on the bio description of your book on Amazon. You crushed it right there. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, we had a handful of teams in the mix there. And um, I remember the Bills calling me in about the fifth round. I thought they were picking me. I thought that was it. I thought that was the phone call. Um, and turned out to just be like, hey, we're interested in you as a, a priority free agent type of guy. So uh, without naming names on, on all of the teams that were out there, I mean, there was a handful reaching out. And eventually you just have to have that, that decision with your support system, the people that are in your corner, the people you trust, uh, to be those sounding boards, whether it's an agent, football coaches, fiance, family members, parents, little sister, whoever it was, to be able to say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna do the best shot. We're gonna give it the best shot we can out there in Oakland, California, and see if we can make a team. What was the deciding factor to go to Oakland? Was it the coaching? Was it the weather? Was it the signing bonus? Because I know different teams give out different signing bonuses. Yeah, so those signing bonuses, man, they were few and far between uh, differential. <laughs> it, it didn't really matter. I wasn't getting offered a whole lot of money uh, one way or another. And it really came down to coaching, came down to style, came down to how their draft shook out in other positions and uh, just feeling like that I, I would have a shot on special teams to maybe crack that roster and you know just do do everything I could to make that happen. And the change in scenery, the change of environment, the, the guys that brought me along, those veterans that were in the locker room, like it really helped like, you know, launch pad that career and be with a bunch of rookies that really laid a foundation there while we were there to uh, do some special stuff. So after you did make it to the league, you suffered some adversity later on in your career. You tore your ACL with the Raiders, and then after that, you turned what could have been a sad story into a success story, being one of the highest paid fullbacks in the league with the Dolphins. How were you able to do that and overcome so much adversity? I think it's, it's a, there's a lot of things that go into that. But at the end of the day, if you embrace the change that's headed for your life, I feel like that's where the biggest leap came for me. I had to embrace the change of location, of scenery, of comfortable, uh, of preparation, of performance, of expectations, like all of it was changing all at the same time. And to be able to not struggle to keep yourself in the same box that you're used to, that you're comfortable in, and let yourself grow. Let yourself grow into different aspects of your life, to find different hobbies, pursuits, 
you know, different routines that can build you up, that can make you a better athlete, a better football player, to reprioritize your life. Like all of that change really, it, it left a blank slate for me. And I was able to really attack it how I knew I could. And when you get out of your circumstance, when you get out of that environment, uh, you're able to kind of reflect and, and have some self-awareness about, man, that probably wasn't the best Friday night routine for me, or that wasn't the best Tuesday off day routine for me. So to be able to kind of reflect, have that self-awareness, have that downtime with the ACL, and then come back motivated to, to prove a point, uh, I think all of that kind of added added fuel to the fire to be able to, to come back and have a successful season um, statistics wise, but on the field to maybe be able to come back, to be able to be a leader in the locker room and there's so much more to be accomplished, right? And you understand your process and how you go through it and how you work through it. Man, I think that's where real special special things can happen, real powerful moments can come from. Would you say that it was a blessing in disguise tearing your ACL? And I guess if that wouldn't have happened, would you still see yourself in Oakland or how did all that play out? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's I, hindsight's the best, you know, best reference, right? So you can look back and say, man, if I didn't tear it, may, I might have been here, might have been there, could have been paid this, could have been paid that. And it's like, at the end of the day, man, that's that's what you went through and it was made for you. And to understand that, to embrace it, to accept it and to move forward with it, man, I, I've been through a lot of failures, a lot of success stories, a lot of wins, a lot of losses, and it's all gotten me to this point right here. And if you don't think that was for some bigger purpose and something bigger than you and uh, is for a bigger community, bigger um, group of people, man, I, I just feel like you're kidding yourself. And so you just move, move as fluidly as possible, use everything as motivation, find silver linings everywhere. And I think that was definitely a blessing in disguise. It did not feel like it for the nine months that you're trying to rehab to get back onto the field. Um, but you do know in the deep, deepest part of your heart that this is going to be something good. And I feel like any piece of adversity, any tough times, uh, when you're going through it in life, man, I think that understanding that and owning that and figuring out and keep fighting, I think all of those things are solid messages to kind of carry forward. That's an amazing message. Everything happens for a reason. And let's just stay on the topic of adversity. Your quarterback, Tua Tagovailoa, faced the immense amount of adversity this season with his concussions and recovery, faced a lot of noise for it. As an athlete, how do you block out the noise and is it possible to completely shut it out? I don't think it's ever a possibility to completely shut out the noise, but you can definitely use it to your benefit. And if you unify through that as a team, I think that brings you together, it brings you stronger, it brings you closer. Uh, it helps identify what type of culture that you want to move forward with. It, it introduces the true character of a lot of people in, in the locker room. Um, when you're going through adversity with a teammate beside yourself, whatever it is. So, um, you know, I think we definitely used it as a way to, in the best positive light you possibly could have, right? Like, it's terrible. Uh, you hate for anyone to have to go through injuries, but that's a part of our game. And to see um, the way that our teammates respond, the, the way that they pick each other up when they're down, the way that they're able to um, go through that, I think that's where you see each other's discipline you see each other's commitment to excellence you see each other's sacrifice on a daily basis so you have a lot of respect for everybody in that locker room and the way we handled it i think was the right way of course you have such a great mindset great positive attitude where do you get that from is that is there someone you contribute it to because i haven't seen someone this positive in a long time i think it's just you got to fight for it every single day it's not easy you know, there's people work through things in different ways and to be negative or to vent to, to other people like that's a part of life. There's positive and negative emotions everywhere. And to be able to consistently try and find that silver lining, it's like a muscle, man. It, your mind is one of the biggest muscles that you can use. Uh, so let's utilize it to the best of your ability and to be positive, to work through things and, and be honest and feel through them and move forward with them. Uh, I think all of that is important. I feel like you learn through however you tick in life and to have that self-awareness, but then also to, to be able to bring people along, right? To build a community, to build people up. I think all of that matters and yeah, everyone's different. So, you know, I try and read a little bit, try and journal a little bit, try and have talks like this a little bit. And I feel like it all has a purpose and all has a meaning and every single conversation uh, could be a beneficial one if you try. And that muscle, 
you know, it, it fatigues and you got to work it out and then you got to rest it and then you got to work it out again. So uh, it's like we're in the gym right now, man, just focusing on that positivity. So you say you like to read. I hope the listeners didn't think we were going to go with this whole episode without talking about your new book that came out a couple months ago in January called The Seven Crucibles. Could you tell us a little bit about what it's about and why you decided to write it? Uh, I was, you know, I was on the training table. I was going through my ACL. I'm hardly straightening my leg. Uh, I can't walk. I get called up to the general manager's office and he says, you know, we, we don't need you on the Raiders anymore. And so you're in one of those valleys. You're in one of those tough spots where negative intrusive thoughts come up. And that's just, that's natural. It, it happens. And to find a bigger purpose behind it, to know that I was going to be successful on the other side of it, to know the answers to the test before I was going to face them. It was a lot of self-reflection. It was a lot of journaling. And then it was like, okay, maybe somebody else can use this. Maybe we can put this into a book. Maybe we can share some audio files. Maybe we can really push towards, you know, the next person tearing an ACL in, in a terrible time, whether it's their senior year, whether it's a contract year, whether it's a rookie year. It always seems like it's a terrible time to have an injury, some sort of adversity. What are the answers to the test? How do you mentally fight through that? How do you spiritually, emotionally, physically align yourself to overcome and thrive through adversity? So that was the premise of the book. I wrote it finished it up by July of last year before I stepped back onto a football field, knowing that wherever I was going to be, whatever was going to happen this next year uh, was going to be successful and we're going to make it happen. It was it was manifested. It was decided with my whole heart. And uh, that's that's kind of how we ended up being able to publish it by the end of a, a successful season. And man, it's just the beginning, right? It's just the beginning of a long career here down in Miami. And uh, I think we had left a few games out there as the Dolphins, and I feel like we're coming back hungry, uh, really motivated to be able to, to make some some bigger splashes. So that was the premise of the book. That's why we wrote it. And I really hope that other people are able to use these blueprints and those NFL experiences and all of the examples that are put into that book for their own life and their own journeys and their own path to whatever they deem successful, which I think is why we're all here. Exactly. I couldn't have said it better myself. That is The Seven Crucibles. Make sure you go check it out. It sounds like a fantastic read. Mine is in the mailbox right now, but we'll see what Amazon has to say about that. Where can they find it and is it selling anywhere else besides Amazon? Yeah, I would head over to alecingold.com. There's a little tab. It'll bring you there. But then also there's a bunch of cool stuff on that website, just different social posts that we're having, different foundation stuff I have going on. That's a good way to just stay connected. A, a weekly newsletter of motivation. We call it Mindset Monday. So, you know, if you're if you're more of a book person, if you just want a, a quick little blurb to pop up every Monday, you can sign up for that. If you love foundation events, you want to get involved there. Uh, you know, I'm a big advocate of adoption and foster care. So there's a million different things on that website. You can find the book there, but then also kind of lose yourself in, in whatever else I got going on right now. I love it. So that's the end of the normal questions. Now we're going to transition to the closing ones. It's been amazing to get to know you over the past 20 minutes and talk through everything. I wish I could talk to you longer because there's so many more questions I want to ask. But let's finish this off with some fun questions that listeners won't be able to hear anywhere else. All right, let's do it. So when making this list of questions, I saw in your biography with the Dolphins that you did play quarterback in high school, which is why I set up the rapid fire questions earlier like that. But you were dominant as quarterback. Are you aware of your Wisconsin Player of the Year stat sheet? I have no idea. I probably ran for more touchdowns than I threw for, but um, I don't I don't really know what that, that year, what those numbers were. Okay, well, you were ridiculous. You're right on that account. You had 2,324 rushing yards with 29 touchdowns, 1,400 passing yards, and 15 touchdowns. You had 44 total touchdowns and almost 4,000 total yards. There's not really a question to this. I just saw this, and I'm like, holy buckets. Why has this been a secret kept for so long? And why isn't Mike McDaniel drawing up so wildcat plays does he know that you can do this it's uh it's fun like different parts of of a team coming together different things like this 
um, being able to, to mess around, throw the ball around before practice, like you kind of get to show off. All of a sudden you see different guys that play quarterback, that have an arm. It's, it's really cool to see that. And it's like guys you wouldn't expect. Um, you know, Cedric Wilson is a wide receiver who can sling it. Uh, Melvin Ingram can chuck it. Saving Howard was throwing the ball. So you have a bunch of guys that are really athletic and it's cool to kind of see the, the guys come together on different talents that you have no idea about. So when all the quarterbacks were going down, were you the emergency quarterback or the backup to the emergency quarterback? I don't know. I feel like I so I was the emergency quarterback out in Vegas, um, and I'm glad we never had to, to break the glass, hit the red button, anything like that. And uh, same thing with Miami. I'm glad the guys were, were healthy enough down the stretch where it didn't have to be said or I taking a snap uh, try, trying to make the offense go. So i um, really glad Skylar Thompson and, and Teddy Bridgewater could step up late in the season. Skyler, for being a seventh round rookie out of Kansas State, he did a phenomenal job leading the team and he was the playoff starter, correct? Yeah, yeah, he brought us up to Buffalo, led us to a, a playoff wild card loss that was right at the end of it. So um, it was cool to see a guy step up like that and grow through everything that he went through this last year. Incredible story right there. This is why I love talking to NFL players because everyone has an incredible story. You just kind of have to dive deep to find it. So let's now go make some lists. Let's make some controversial opinions that I know you're probably excited for. Who is the greatest fullback of all time, in your opinion? Greatest fullback of all time has to be Larry Zonka. And that's respect to the OG. Um, he's definitely on the Mount Rushmore. You got Mike Allstott there. You got Lorenzo Neal up there. Uh, I think those are three of the four. And then I think Kyle Juszczyk is number four. I think that's, the, that's my Mount Rushmore of fullbacks of all time. That's great. Is there anything else you want to speak on that I haven't asked already before we go into your foundation? No, I think it's been a great interview so far, man. I, I'm really excited to wrap this thing up. So your foundation that you started is called the Alec Ingold Foundation. I'd like to donate $50 to your foundation to help continue to support what you're doing. Would you like to talk about your foundation a little bit? Man, I appreciate that donation. I think that's that's amazing what you guys do in this podcast and your platform uh, to, to spread good. And our foundation really is just about serving the adoption and foster care community, being able to be a voice for them, uh, to raise awareness about that. I'm adopted myself, so being able to do a number of events, partner with a number of organizations across the country uh, to help with potential adoptive parents, to kids that have been in foster care for a while, to supporting them past their adoption date, uh, all the way to doing fun stuff like having football camps for them or financial literacy camps that I think are super important that aren't taught enough uh, to the to that youth. And um, just to be able to serve that community has been really a big blessing for my family and I. And I think it's something that is gonna be a lifetime of work, which I'm really excited for. It's so great seeing the work that you're putting in for those kids. Thank you so much for being on the show. That's a wrap on this episode of For the Athlete. Huge shout out to Alec Ingle for taking time out of his day to come onto the show. I hope you can stay healthy and have a great upcoming season. Awesome. Thank you for the time, Brooks. I really appreciate you, man. Thank you for coming on the show. I am Brooks Huber, and you just listened to For the Athlete. Thanks for listening to For the Athlete. As always, be on the lookout for another athlete appearance next week. Make sure to follow us on Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, and wherever you listen to podcasts.